Managing the Engineers and Laboratory at Halliburton Cementing. Next, I'm going to tell today's rundown. As shown on the screen, after the opening is lecturing session, which will be delivered by Mr. Wahyu. The lecturing session begins with Halliburton company profile and brief sharing about Mr. Wahyu's career at Halliburton. Continued with the presentation of cementing laboratory, cementing process, and cementing additives. During the lecturing session, participants are encouraged to drop their questions in the chat room as we will pick a few to be answered in the Q&A session. Don't forget to mention your name, major, and institution before asking your question. Now, not to waste any more time, we would like to invite Mr. Wahyu Pambudi Wicaksono to start the session. Mr. Wahyu, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Anindya, for inviting me uh, to have this uh, seminar. So actually, this is my first time to conduct this kind of seminar. Uh, eventually, I did several uh, live streaming uh, seminar, but not with the uh, campus student. This is uh, very exciting for me because, yeah, uh, as we know, campus has uh, enthusiastic in the oil and gas, even though there are several uh, up and down in oil and gas industry. Uh, but yeah, still, oil and gas industry is still a good thing. To take about okay, uh, so I'll uh, share my presentation, or it will be shared by. It will be shared. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this presentation actually will covering uh, cementing design and uh, challenge uh, on the oil well drilling. So. Uh, basically, the cementing surfaces is not only for oil well drilling. As we know, we have also uh, remediation. But on this presentation, probably I'll uh, start uh, about cementing in oil and well drilling. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, Gedo for uh, today's presentation. Uh, first, as an introduction, I'll introduce a uh, brief summary of my career and then uh, I also share about cementing what is uh, cementing background and also uh, what is Halliburton uh, what is our role in oil and gas industry uh, so first of all I just would like to know what is the background of the audience is the audience always the uh, student member or there was some uh, uh, practitioner, or there is some uh, other people that are already working. Uh, the background is students. Okay, Morris, student in what level? Uh, first entry, uh, middle entry, or the last uh, year in the school? Uh, it's mixed from first entry to middle and last. Okay. And most of the students coming from chemical engineering, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And then uh, after the reduction, chemical uh, cementing background, and then we'll challenge. I'll share about design, uh, cementing design parameter, and then uh, lab testing, and then uh, cementing operation and uh, cementing evaluation. Okay, next. Okay, so I just want to introduce myself. So. Uh, I was born in 1983, it's around 35 years ago. Uh, so I was born in a small city in the central Java. Uh, and then I took my senior high school uh, in Blora. It's same uh, territory with when I was born, but it's around 40 kilometers from uh, my hometown. So, and then on 2001, I took chemical engineering in Gajah Mada University. So, the funny thing is, until I was graduated from chemical engineering, I have not no idea about uh, oil industry, even though I was born in Chepu. But during those times, there are no well drills in my area. And then when I'm joining Halliburton in 2006, uh, I was joined as associate technical professional in uh, fracking 
and then my first assignment is uh, go to South Sumatra. And this is my first time going abroad out of uh, my island. And this is the, the good thing. <laughs> okay, and the next. Okay, and then uh, what the good thing when I was working in Halibutan is as an international company, so the Halibutan uh, give us opportunity to travel around the world, even though just only for training, but this is a good opportunity for us to be traveling around the world. So I'm starting uh, learning uh, my first uh, engineering grade in uh, Malaysia. And then in 2009, I had uh, visiting uh, USA uh, for training. And then uh, there is also several uh, training aboard in Singapore and in Egypt and in UAE. Connect. Okay, and then what is Halliburton? So actually Halliburton is not only a cementing company. Uh, Halliburton is a service company. As we know, when oil company drill the well, they will need service company to assist it. So the service company will be from a uh, rig company. Rig company, rig is the only services that not Halliburton, that Halliburton not provide, but Halliburton provide other service other than uh, rig company. So starting from uh, directional drilling, we provide directional drilling, and then we provide mud to clean up the cutting during uh, drilling. And then uh, casing usually was provided by company uh, itself. And then uh, we do cementing. Uh, other than that, after we completed the well, there was some uh, completion. We, com we provide completion as well. And then after the well completed, if there were any well surface required to uh, enhance the production also, and also to uh, repair the well, we also provide those kind of surface like uh, coil tubing and then fracturing, acidizing, and so on. And what Halliburton provide, we provide a uh, well surface, a uh, surface company, not only for on-soil drilling, but also offshore drilling and then geothermal drilling. Uh, maybe geothermal is another thing that uh, happened today and then uh, walk over. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to share about the history of cement. So what is uh, cement and why we need cement on the oil well drilling? So the first cement was produced by uh, Greeks and Romans from volcanic ash with a uh, select time. And Yosef Aspedin is a uh, uh, engineer from Leeds, England that was invented uh, Portland cement. So what is Portland cement? Portland cement, does, it was cement that was made from limestone and clay. So the name of the Portland was coming from uh, the area in Leeds, uh, England. Uh, and as we know, uh, maybe some of you already take this uh, school about uh, Portland cement. So this is the process how the cement, the Portland cement was made. So Portland cement basically is made from the limestone and clay, and then it was heat the high temperature, and then it was resulting the the uh, clinker, and then the clinker will be uh, grinding, and then it will uh, and adding some uh, gypsum, and then it will created the Portland cement. The next. Okay, so why we mean we need uh, cementing for well surface? As we know, uh, when we drill a well, we will make a big hole. This hole will be bigger than the casing that was running. So to fill up the gap between the casing and the well, so we put cement there. So what we did, we pump cement from the casing and then uh, it was coming out of the casing and it will fill up the annulus between the casing and the well. The next. So this is the uh, typical casing that was being run. So there was a conductor, uh, the first casing, usually the conductor was uh, piling and then we have a 
and then we drill a surface case, uh, surface hole. Usually it will depend, usually a 17 and a half, and then we run uh, surface casing 13.38, or probably if we drill 26 in hole, we will uh, run 20 inch. So uh, in oil industry, the unit that was used is the uh, American unit, yeah. So if on the college you are familiar with the meters, with the centimeters, and then kilograms, and then liter. So on the oil industry, some uh, companies still use this uh, type of uh, unit of measurement, but most of uh, service company using the American uh, unit. So for uh, plank, usually we use feet instead of meters. And then for diameters, usually we use inches instead of centimeters. And then for weight, usually we use pond. And for volume, we use gallon and barrel. So just my hints, if you want to uh, work in our industry, just be familiar with this uh, units. So just you need to have some idea how much is one feet, how much is one inches, how much is one gallon, how much is one barrel. So this is just a uh, common sense that we, ne we need to have before we are entering uh, oil industry. Okay, and then after we drill uh, surface casing, we will set a... Uh, Sorry, after we drill surface hole and then we set surface casing, we do cementing for surface casing. And then after that, we will drill uh, intermediate uh, casing. So the uh, purpose and the challenge between surface and intermediate will be different. So surface casing usually was used to uh, protect us uh, with the aquifer. So after we, uh, set the surface casing, usually we will drill intermediate. So usually in intermediate, we will see uh, gas there. So the uh, function of the casing will be protect the gas. So uh, the gas will not uh, percolate it and entering the production uh, casing. Then after we drill intermediate hole, and then we set the intermediate casing, then we drill production casing. Then after we drill production, we set production casing, usually we can set either casing or uh, drilling liner. Then we uh, completed the well. Usually we lock if we need to do CBL and then we perforate, then we can produce the well for oil and gas uh, well. But for geothermal well, that will be slightly different because usually for uh, geothermal, we not uh, run and cement production casing because usually production casing was run in the perforated mode so we don't have to do cemented the production okay. okay so this is the uh the reason why we do cementing the well so basically what is the principle the function of a uh, primary cement so by having a uh, cement fluid in the uh, open hole what we want is we can restrict uh, fluid movement between formation. So if we have a water zone above and then oil and gas zone below, so we can, so on the first time when we make a hole, there will be some gap, right? And there will be some channel between uh, water zone and gas zone. And we don't want this because if we produce the gas and there is a connection between gas and water, so instead of producing gas on oil, maybe we will produce water. So what we did, we do cementing. So between water and gas zone, no longer connected. So there was an isolation. That's why we need uh, cementing for production casing. And then other than that, uh, we also want to support the casing as well, because uh, if casing was exposed with the uh, oil environment, with the water environment, the casing may can get corroded. So uh, by uh, having uh, the cement, we can protect the casing, and then we will have a uh, much longer production time. And then the other use of casing, sometimes uh, if we want to uh, 
reduce the load that was hauled by casing, we can have the cement as well. And sometimes if there is a low circulation or there is a thief zone, usually we do cementing to seal the loss uh, circulation. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, let me start with the how we do cement design. So basically, uh, we as cementing will have this data from the customer. So customer will give us the data where they want to set the casing and then uh, what type of cement they are gonna use. And then uh, they will also let us know what is mud that uh, was used to drill this well as well. Because the idea is we have to remove the mud. So we will leaving the hole with the cement instead of with the mud. So uh, this uh, casing depth was designed by, usually was designed by uh, customer, but as a cementing engineer, we have to know why we have to set this casting in this depth. And uh, if we think that it is necessary, we change the depth of the casting. We can uh, give this I give this uh, information to customer as well, so we can advise them. Maybe we have to change the casting depth. Maybe if we have to change the uh, mud density, maybe if we have to change the cement density as well. Okay, so from this depth, we'll have uh, two uh, cementing section. The surface casing is uh, 40 meters. Uh, so usually on the surface casing, the type of cement that was used is the hard, is the fast setting cement. So usually they just run 15.8, or 16 ppg. And then after that, uh, we will set intermediate casing. So for this intermediate casing, usually the formation is a uh, little bit soft. So the cement density that was used uh, for this uh, section usually is lighter than the uh, first uh, cement uh, surface. So in cement chain, actually, there are, there are no rocket scientists. There is only several things that we have to remember from what we have in college. Uh, first of all is, uh, so um, maybe many of you already take the uh, process transfer uh, uh, material, right? So on the process transfer, there was a material when we can calculate the friction. So uh, that's, that's actually this is the the key of the cementing is to ensure that we still have a safe working pressure during the job. So maybe you can continue to the next slide. Okay. So on this slide, you will see there was a data of uh, power pressure and pressure gradient. Uh, why this data is important? So on this data. Uh, we can ensure whether our fluid will be safe or not. So the parameter why our fluid is safe is our fluid will be on the zone between pore pressure and fracture gradient. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we know on the process transfer, we can calculate the friction, right? So uh, fluid, even it's cement, it's a spacer, it will have a fluid rheology. And then from this fluid rheology, we can calculate how much pressure, friction pressure that will be given by the fluid during the pumping. So uh, we can calculate how much uh, friction factor that will given by the cement. So the total friction factor, we will edit this with this actual, uh, hydrostatic pressure of the fluid. So this is another thing that we have to understand, hydrostatic pressure. What is hydrostatic pressure? How we can calculate hydrostatic pressure? And, and uh, how this will apply into our cement design. So actually on cementing, there are no rocket scientists, like I said before, but we have to know the basic concept of uh, fluid dynamic. We can have to know how we can calculate volume. We have to know how we can calculate the pressure. And 
we have to know how we can ensure that our cement will be placed safely during the cement job. So uh, we do uh, from this uh, professor and fracture guardian uh, data, we can uh, we can uh, show us where we can set the casing. So it, you see on this step on around 1100 uh, meters, there is a transition between the uh, soft formation to the hard formation. So the power pressure will be changed dram dramatically. That's why we have to set cement, uh, I'm sorry, we have to set casing right away before we entering the high gas pressure. So maybe if you uh, do remember uh, Lapindo mud uh, blowout, so uh i don't know maybe this is too early or maybe this is uh, still pro and cons but that's the thing that was missed from the calculation if we set the casing uh lower than it's supposed to be so we will have uh, area when our pore pressure will be lower than our uh, fracture gradient so if for example if we set casing at 1200 so on the top section our power pressure is in 12 bpg, but on the on the down side we have a area with the uh, power pressure of 12 bpg as well. So this is will be very dangerous because we cannot control the mud that was going to use. So what we have to do, we have to set the the casing before we entering the zone. So for example, if we set the casing in the 1100, and then this is still so the uh, fracture gradient that was applied was on the 17. So we have a room from 10 ppg to 17 ppg. This is a room that we can play around. Okay, next. Okay. Okay, so other than uh, this for pressure and fracture gradient, another thing that was important on the Cement design was uh, separator. So as we know, the reaction was uh, the reaction of chemical was uh, made by three three factor, right? Temperature, pressure, and then uh, energy, uh, kinetic energy. We know that kinetic energy will not change because the size of cement is, is there. The pressure will be depending based on the depth. And also the temperature will be also depending by the depth as well. So for designing cement, we have to know uh, where is the uh, spot that we will uh, design. So we will have us. So for example, if we set the casting in the 900, so we have to ensure that our cement will be safe if we pump at 900 meters, meaning that from this uh, temperature profile, we know that the uh, temperature that was exposed on the 900 meters is around 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have to test our cement in this uh, temperature. Okay, so okay, next. Okay, so uh, from the uh, cement descent, this is a step by step that we have to consider when we design the uh, cement design. So first of all, we will calculate how much cement volume that we are going to pump. So the cement volume will be calculated based on the placement, the final placement of the cement. If we want to have cement on the annulus from the feet, then we have to calculate how much volume that gonna need uh, to be placed from the uh, TD to 500 uh, feet uh, depth. So we have to calculate how we have to see what is uh, annulus on this depth. So if there is a casing to casing, if there is open hole and casing, or if there is some shoe that was left inside the casing, we have to calculate it, all of this. 
and then for placement so after we pump cement we have to pump the displacement fluid as well so the so once we pump the cement so top of so the the tail of the cement will be on the wellhead right so we have to displace it down below so the top of cement the end of the cement will be on the shoe track on the road shoe of the casing and then we can calculate how much volume of cement and then how much uh, volume of displacement from this volume we can calculate how many time will be required uh, for this job so from this time we will design how much the thickening time uh, so uh, maybe many of you not know what is thickening time thickening time is a time that was uh, determine when the when the cement is in liquid uh, stage so as we know so probably if you see cement on your dairy activity your cement is the is made of cement uh, sand and water but if we use this type of cement the cement will be unpumpable right because it was not fluid so the cement that was used on the oil industry is liquid version. So uh, we will only have cement and water. So for your information, uh, why on the cement density there was 15 8 ppg cement density? Because this is the the ideal condition of the cement when cement and water in the uh, ideal proportion. So. Uh, as you know, same like in in uh, building uh, business. So the ratio of the cement and water, uh, two volume of cement and one volume of water. So with two and one uh, ratio of cement and water, we'll have 15.8 ppg slurry. So this is the the ideal condition of the cement. So this 15.8 cement slurry will have specific thickening time. So for example, the 15.8, so probably in the temperature of around uh, 90 degrees, it will have thickening time around 1.5 hours. So if we calculate from the slurry volume, we know, for example, the cement volume is uh, 300 barrel and then the displacement is 200 barrel. And then how, how fast we can pump? How fast we can pump, we can, and for example, uh, the current uh, cementing unit can pump up to seven barrel per minute. So if we have 500 barrels and then we pump at 700, uh, seven barrel per minute, we will need time at around 50 divided by 70, uh, probably around 60 minutes, sometimes 60 minutes, one hour. So the thickening time that we use for uh, pumping time one hour, we can add uh, safety factor one and a half hour so our thickening time is two and a half and then uh, if you remember on the previous slide the uh, well bore temperature is 160 so as you know the 58 will have thickening time uh, one and a half hour in 90 degrees Fahrenheit but this descent we need to pump it in 160 and then we need the thickening time uh, two and a half hours. So what we need, we need to increase the thickening time of the slurry. So what we have to add to increase the thickening time, we need additive. That's why uh, on the cementing industry, on the cementing surface, we will uh, play around on the additive because basically the type of cement will not match with what we are required so we need to add the additive to enhance to change the properties of the slurry so we need to have slurry who can withstand two and a half hour in the liquid stage in 160 degree Fahrenheit temperature so we need uh, additives as a uh, retarders as to extend the thickening time Okay, and then uh, I will uh, talk later 
on the uh, equipment that was used to test this uh, parameters. And then after that, uh, when we pump, the cement will have a tendency of rheology. So sometimes if the rheology is high, is too high, we will have more friction, meaning that we will have more uh, possibility of uh, increasing uh, recircula circul equivalent circulating density. That's why we need to add another additive to make the cement uh, thinner than it's supposed to be. So that's why we need additive like this percent. And then if uh, during mixing, sometimes there was some air entering to the uh, cement, we don't want to uh, have this air, we have to add the deformer on the uh, cement slab. So that's about the slurry volume. We have to know how much volume that we uh, gonna be pump, and then we have to know how much uh, time that we need for safety uh, factor for safety uh, safe uh, pumping time. And then from this volume, we can calculate how much horsepower that we gonna need. So you have to back again on your uh, clutch material how we can calculate require horsepower. If we want to pump cement with this pressure, with this rate, how much horsepower that we gonna need. That's the thing that was considered as what type of uh, equipment may require uh, to perform the job. Okay, and then the pressure calculation, uh, this will be depend on the how much pressure we will see, how much pressure we are expecting. And then uh, on this uh, scenario, we can be, we can ensure that our uh, pumping schedule is safe. Uh, so it's always below the fracture variant. And then well requirement. So in some condition, we need to see the fluid loss because as you know, uh, additive may have tendency to uh, losing water with the permeable with the permeable zone. So uh, the uh, rule of this phenomena is fluid loss. So we have to control the fluid loss of the slurry. That's why. So why we have to control the fluid loss of the slurry? So if the slurry have is losing so many water, meaning that the water and cement ratio will be different from what we have on the lab testing. So like I said before, uh, we have cement and water ratio to have thickening time, for example, two and a half hours. But during the pumping, if we have so many fluid loss, meaning that the water ratio will be changed a lot, we will have less water ratio, meaning that probably the thickening time that we test two and a half on the lab testing will be different with thickening time that we gonna see on the well bore because with the losing of the water, the water and cement ratio getting in decreasing so much. So probably it will resulting the thickening time may gonna be decreased from what we designed. That's why we need with loss on the cement additive. And then next is a uh, slurry compressive strength. So like I said before, the ideal cement density is 15.8. So what if we need to have like the cement density, for example, uh, 13 ppg. So what happened? So the easy thing for us to reduce the cement density is adding the water, right? But by having more water and cement ratio, we will have less compressive strength. So if we have so much water and cement ratio, probably the result, the cement may not get hard. So probably the cement will be always soft, never get hard because the cement is not uh, having uh, ideal water and cement ratio. So uh, we need to add additive to enhance the compressive strength of the slurry. By what? So sometimes we can add a lightweight additive like a glass bead. So we can have, so we can put the uh, additive with low SG 
so we can reduce the water requirement and then we can end up with the uh, high compressive strength or we can introduce another additive like we have a, a silica oxide we have a calcium uh, material material that can increase compressive strength of the slurry and then the last of the list uh, last but not the least is the static gel strength static gel strength so during cement period when the cement was uh, transforming from the liquid state to the solid state there was a state states when the slurry was on colloidal form on this colloidal form the cement will lose his uh, hydrostatic force meaning that when there was a gas on this period so the cement will be uh, will enable to hold the gas that's why uh, there will be uh, gas migration so this is a uh, really important uh, because we don't want to have gas migration during cement set okay Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, how we can determine the cement density is by having uh, the water ratio, the ratio between water and cement. If we have 58, the water to cement ratio will be at stable state. But if we want to have slurry with different water and cement ratio, we will need this type of additive to enhance the properties of the cement uh, like retarder like i mentioned before if we need more thickening time we will need retarder to extend the slurry thickening time and then accelerator if the temperature is low enough and then we pump lighter cement density so if we not put this accelerator probably the cement will not set for example like uh, two days so if we want to accelerate this reaction, we want to have cement set in the eight hour, we need to add accelerator. And then this percent, as I mentioned before, this percent was add to uh, thinner to, to reduce the uh, viscosity of the cement. And then deformer, deformer is uh, used to reduce uh, the foam that will uh, made during the cement mixing and then free additive as i mentioned before is to prevent water from losing from the cement and then process compressive strength enhancer and then anti-gas migration and mechanical properties enhancer because as i mentioned before uh during well drilling probably we will not see this effect but during the well production uh if there was a uh, so many challenges on the well uh probably there was some fracturing there was some uh uh perforating there was some acid in the well there was some shock load and so on and so on probably we need to enhance the mechanical properties of the cement so the mechanical properties of the cement actually this mechanical cement properties is not only the compressive strength so if we have if we take material, uh, material construction, what is in OE? Uh, during my college, there was a, a material on the uh, mechanical construction of uh, chemical engineering. So on this uh, material, we learn uh, the how the material will be broken. So we ha have to know what is the modulus young of this material what is the uh, position ratio of this material to make this material is resilient enough. So uh, other than just compressive strength, on the next uh, cementing uh, research that we are doing, we have to see also the mechanical properties of the cement, the position ratio of the cement, the modulus young of the cement, to ensure that the cement will not fail during the production uh, stage. Okay, Okay, so uh, we are entering into the lab testing uh, 
presentation. So this is the thing that we have to do when we are designing the cement. So from uh, from my previous presentation, I'm I'm telling that there was a requirement on the cement, like uh, cement density, and then uh, rheology, and then thickening time, and then split loss, and then uh, free water probably, and then compressive strength, and then static gel strength. That's the uh, parameter that we need uh, to be put on the cement. So on this on this uh, web. So this is table that I was taken from Halliburton web. So on this web, we can uh, generate the request that was requesting to the uh, lab testing. So on this web, we will put the cement density and then the design parameter of the cement. What is the thickening time? What is the uh, fluid loss? What is the compressive strength? What is the rheology that we are required? And then on the lab, they will descend the cement and then do the testing. And then the lab technician will be informed the engineer what is the result of the slurry that was designed by engineer. For example, if the thickening time is only two hours and then the engineer needs three hours, then engineer will be redesign the slurry by adding retarder. And lab testing uh, lab guys will be test the slurry, this slurry again, and then and then see what is the thickening time. So the thickening time already meet the requirement, and then we can continue to the next test. The next. Okay, so this is the uh, slurry preparation. So uh, as we know, on the unit, how we mix the cement, we will mix cement on the cement pump, so probably on my presentation number three or number four, yeah, I was showing the uh, cementing unit. So on the cementing unit, we have what we call a cement mixer. So on the unit, we have um, the cement. So we will blow the cement from the uh, silo into this RCM, and then the water will be met with this cement on the RCM. So this uh, method was used on the mixer as well. So we will add the water and the cement on the mixer. So this mixer will be designed with the uh, exact RPM to ensure that this RPM will be same as what we see on the cement mixer. So for example, if we mix in the 4,000 RPM, we will do testing in the 4,000 RPM. If we mix cement in the 12,000 RPM, we will do mixing in the 12,000 uh, RPM. Next. Okay, and then uh, after we do cement, we will take the rheology of the cement. So that's for information as well during the process transfer uh, matter, you will know what the fluid regime, you will know what is Newtonian fluid regime, what is power law fluid regime, what is Bingham fluid regime, and what is the uh, Haskell-Buckley fluid regime. So this test, so if you are in the college, how you can determine the viscosity is by using a uh, viscosity matter. But the cement, as it is not Newtonian fluid, so the rheology of cement, the viscosity of cement, will be depend on the uh, movement of the slurry. So we will test this uh, slurry with several speeds, starting from 3 RPM up to 300 RPM, to see what is the, the uh, gel strength, what is the strength, that was read by this uh, this uh, equipment, and then from this result, we can input this to our simulation to simulate what is our uh, expected, what is our calculated pressure that we're gonna see during this cement job. And then from this from this uh, testing, we can know if we need to put like a uh, dispersion on the slurry, 
maybe if the slurry is too thin, we need to pay to add the viscosifier on the slurry. So we will design how the slurry will be look like. So this parameter, so we will see the rheology of the slurry. Okay, next. And then after the rheology, we will test the slurry uh, on the SPST uh, on the SPST to test the tickling time of the slurry. So the tickling time will give us the tickling time chart. So we will see the consistency of the slurry starting from the pumping consistency until unpumping consistency. So on this uh, tickling time, we need to input the temperature and also the pressure for this uh, unit. And then the result that we'll have is the consistency. So we will see how long it will take from the slurry, from the pumpable state until it unpumpable state stage. So the unpumpable state, uh, if APA recommendation, it was 100 uh, burden consistency. But from Halliburton, we use the safety margin. So we use 70 uh, burden consistency as unpumpable, unpumpable state. So the time from the uh, starting point of the test until it was reach 70 BC is the thickening time. So this thickening time should be longer than our pumping time. So if uh, we have like a descent thickening time will be at around four hours. Okay, man. Okay, after thickening time, this is another test that we is the fluid loss. So on this fluid loss cell, we will have permeable uh, screen on the below. Uh, the permeable screen is around 300 uh, mesh. So we will put the slurry inside the chamber and then we will calculate how much water will be losing from this uh, cell. So if the volume is so many, meaning that all fluid will be uh, coming out, then the slurry will be not stable when it was, plus, it was placed on the well bore because on the well bore, there was some uh, permeability on it. So if we put the slurry on this permeable, the water will be coming out and then will be resulting the cement was not as stable. Long. So maybe we can extend the question and answer session because it may end in next couple of minutes. The next is uh, the compressive strength. So the compressive strength is to uh, so during our laboratory. So I don't know in uh, University of Indonesia we have this experiment. So have a break, we can calculate how much force that was uh, applied on the brick by crush it into the chamber. So the, the conventional type to know the compressive strength is by crushing the brick, right? But on the oil industry, we don't have to crush the brick to know the strength of the brick. So, uh, if we remember on the uh, physics school, uh, there was a, a change on the uh, speed of the fluid of, uh, I'm sorry, there is a change on the speed of the sun when it was uh, passing the, the material with the different, har different, different harness. So this uh, parameter was used on this test. So we will have this uh, this chamber, the UCA, the UCA uh, compressive strength. So we will put this uh, sun frequently. Then we will 
measure the harden of the cement by the time where the sun was traveling from the uh, emitter to the receiver. So on this chart, there was a, a transit time. So faster the time at, that was required to move the sun from one point to another point, it will reflect the harden of the cement. So if it's starting from like a transit time in, it's in 35 minutes, it will end in 20 minutes. So this is the time when the cement was moving from the liquid states to the uh, solid states and harding states. Okay, next. And then the last one is the static gel strength. So the static gel strength, this is to ensure how much time that was required from the slurry from the uh, liquid states that was changed to the uh, solid states. So the uh, time that was required from uh, 100 uh, pound post to 500 pound post, it is the transition time. So from the API, uh, they are recommended the time that was required from the slurry to move from 100 to 500 pound force should be less than 45 minutes. So by having this short time, we will have our cement will be stable enough. So the gas will not percolate it on the slurry. Okay, next. Okay, I think this is the presentation. Uh, I don't know if I already cover all of your needs or there were several uh, questions that you will need to address uh, because this is my first presentation. I don't know if this presentation already meet your requirement or there is another thing that you need to know. You can just ask me and then I'll try my best to answer your question. Okay, let I'll return this session to the moderator again. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wahyu, for sharing your knowledge with us and giving such an informative and interesting presentation. So the participants have gained their insight about Halliburton Company and Cementing Laboratory. Now we will now begin the Q&A session. So it, it looks like there's already a question from Raihan Izzat from Materials Physics, Universitas Indonesia. Uh, for Raihan Izzat, can you un unmute your mic and ask your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, am I visible right now? Yes. Right. So, um, uh, afternoon, Pak Wahyu. Uh, thank you yeah. for um, attending this uh, session. <laughs> okay. uh, so, um, actually, I would like to ask uh, two questions for today. Um, um, as we all know, uh, Pak Wahyu is a technical professional at uh, Halliburton. So, I would like to ask something about um, cementing. Okay. So, um, as we understand, um, uh, they have higher temperature compared to uh, conventional wells. Um, I think it's around 180-ish degrees to 200-ish, but I'm not really sure though. So, um, what measure does Halliburton has to offer um, to be able to hold the well integrity while the cement is heated by the formation? Um, I think in uh, in most papers it is stated that uh, if this cement expands, it will uh, correlate to the external pressures induced by the uh, stresses. And um, I think uh, the volumetric expansion could actually uh, turn out to be uh, overpressure, and uh, that would result in the collapse of the casing string. Uh, so, what do you think, and how can Halliburton help that um, particular problem? And uh, the number two question is that if for some reason the casing shoe uh, measure depth is um, located in a heavily fractured formation, how do we do the cement job without getting much losses to the formation? Does Halliburton have a special cement slurry mix to combat the fractured zone? Or do we ha just have to play with the weight of the lead and tail uh, cement slurry? Just change the PPG, you know. Um, thank you. Good day, Pak Wahyu. 
is a tough question. Okay. So, uh, if we see on the semen integrity, so as I mentioned before, other than compressive strength, on the enhanced uh, semen uh, design, so other than just compressive strength, there was also uh, mechanical properties that we have to consider. So, if if I I can uh, reword your question, so actually this is not only for uh, HPST. So the the most uh, aggressive, the most tragic way that was happen may happen on the geothermal well because on the HPST maybe the maximum temperature is only maybe 400 degree Fahrenheit is the highest. SPST that happened in Indonesia, but on the geothermal well, during the production section, uh, the the temperature of the well can be up to 350 degrees Celsius. Maybe the the hottest geothermal well that I have ever observed is in Lahendong. It's around 150 to 400 degrees Celsius. So during this uh, temperature, so what happened to the casing? So as a metals casing will have the uh, uh, elongation by the temperature. So if the temperature is increasing, the casing will be elongated. What happened if the casing was elongated enough? So meaning that if we have the, the cement with high compressive strength, as we learn, higher compressive strength will cause the cement to be brittle. So if there is any movement on the cement, if there is any change on the elongation of the cement, the cement will be failed. So what we have to do, we have to design the cement elastic enough so the cement will be following the elongation of the casing. So if the casing is elongated, for example, 1%, the cement has to be elongated also in 1%. So this concept was used in our geothermal cement design. So we have to design the cement to be elongated enough so it can following the elongation of the casing. So the cement will be will be elongated, cement will be elastic. We need to have we need to put some additive on the cement so the cement will be elastic. So when the casing was elongated, the cement will be following the elongated. So instead of the cement and casing was Falling down with this elongation, the cement and casing will be stay together. So this is the uh, design that we was approaching to maintain the uh, high temperature that we are observe on the geothermal. Okay, and then the next question. Let's answer your question. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, actually, um, I heard from a paper and some discussions from uh, professionals that uh, the last link campaign in Sokoria had a different cement slurry additive in geothermal drilling and to cement the tie back <laughs> production casing. But I wasn't really sure uh, which uh, cement property should be played to, um, to overcome the problem. And uh, yeah. you happen to... Uh, Answer the question. Yeah. Thank you. So, so this is the uh, the application that we uh, tend to uh, propose. So, in geothermal, there was several geothermal. There was several geothermal in Indonesia. So, like in we starting from the Salau, Salau, I think the, starting with the Sarula, the high temperature Sarula, and then we have uh, Ululais, Ulubelu, uh, Sungai Penuh, and then uh, Lumut Balai. And then on Java, we have uh, Karha Bodas, we have Kamojang, we have uh, Gunung Sala, we have uh, Gunung Derajat, and then we have uh, Wayang Windu, and then we have Ijen, and then on... Dieng as well. Yeah. And Dieng, we have Patuha, and then on uh, Maluku, we have Flores, and then we have Orca, we have Sokoria, we have Sorik. This area has its own specific. So, for example, in... Uh, regular uh, geothermal well, if we just use regular cement, it will stay there forever. For example, like in, in Ulubelu, uh, in Lumut Balai, we don't need to treat the cement uh, special. 
But in some area, when we see the temperature is uh, so high, when we see the pre the production is so high, that's the that's the time when we need to introduce a new parameter on the cement. So, for example, if we just use the regular cement uh, density with the common modulusium, the cement like I mentioned before, when the casing was grow, and then the cement will not following the growth of the casing, and then the cement will be collapsing, and the casing resulting walkover that was required. But if we can maintain the mechanical properties of the cement, so the cement can following the uh, expansion of the casing. So when the casing is grow, the cement will be following grow. So in this uh, condition, we will have a more longer uh, cement time. So for example, for, for sure, the first requirement will become from customer, right? So if customer doesn't, doesn't consider this area will be uh, high temperature enough, so probably the salary that was used will be regular salary. But if in other hand, if the customer require the salary to be different, the salary to be have more uh, mechanical properties, then we can enhance this mechanical properties. So something like that. Okay, and then the second question. So if we set the casing into the fracture, Formation. So, so actually, if we are dealing with the fracture, we have to see is this fracture can be cured by lightening the cement density or not. If the fracture is there, for example, if we just drill cement with the if we drill the well with the water and we see the fracture, think that even with 8.3 ppg slurry, the formation will enable to hold. So the thing that we do is we have to uh, improve this uh, fracture. So we have to cure this losses by pumping cement or by setting LCM. And then we will drill again this formation and then see if we can improve the, uh, the formation, the uh, stability of this formation. If we cannot improve the stability, so we have to set the casing higher so we cannot set the casing in this depth because the requirement of the casing set the casing should be set into the basement the casing should be set into the hard formation if the casing was set into the soft formation the the idea of setting casing will be not made so we have to set the casing lower so we can spot the the uh, cement plug below and then we can set the casing above it for spotting the cement plug on the low circulation, there is several uh, method that we can do. We can do, for example, if we can uh, pump the super thick slurry, slurry that was put, stay, and then set, we can, we can use this type of slurry. Or if we need the more aggressive, we can pump, so probably like a sodium, alum, uh, sodium silicate with Spots of sodium silicate, we pump cement. When the sodium silicate meet with cement, it will react and it will create cement suddenly. That's the thing that we can do if we have to deal with this uh, type of losses. So for my perspective, if we see the, the big losses, what we have to do, we have to uh, repair this losses first. But if we think, the time, if we play with the time, okay, for example, okay, that's fine. We can just set this casing there and then we can cement later on and then we can do remediation after that. That will be an uh, uh, option as well. So the option will be come to the customer. How customer will see what is his cost, what is his uh, math loss cost, what is his other cost. So this will be their consideration. What is the next? that will gonna take to deal with this situation. Uh, so, uh, uh, pa, Wahyu, uh, yes. from what I understand is that we, if we cement the low circulation zones, we would have the cement entering the fractures if uh, the uh, formation is naturally fractures. Yes. Fractured. Yes. Uh, but how do we do the leak of test after we dry the cement is set and it's dried? 
how do we do the leak of test before we drill into the next section, the next casing section? So if that's the condition, we cannot do the leak of test because the leak of mm. test. So actually, the 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 reason why we do leak of test is we want to see the uh, stability of the formation, right? Formation. So if the formation is stiff enough, there are no uh, integrity on the formation where we do the leak of test because if we set the cement plug there and then we drill, what we what we leak of test is the cement. So this is not formation leak of test. So if we know that we, if the formation below the casing is, is uh, fragile enough, is uh, close yeah. enough, so uh -huh. nothing, nothing we can do because what we test actually is the cement leak of test. For the next section, we just have to uh, use the uh, fracture gradient data from the uh, geophysicist, right? Yes, because maybe the data that was given by geophysicists is the is not the right data because we see mm -hmm. the fracture that has lower fracture gradient than the data from geophysicists, right? Right. Because that's data that sometimes think that was different from oil and geothermal industry. On oil industry, usually the rock will be, if you go down below, the rock will be getting harder, 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 and harder, right? But on the geothermal, sometimes if we you hit the, the production zone, you will, the rock is hard, but it has porosity. So if you are walking on the mountain area, you will see the big rock, but the big rock will be surrounded by the cavernous. So the, the rock actually is hard, but it has porosity, it has a uh, cave on that. So even with, with the water, it will lose. Right. Thank you for answering, Pao yeah. Okay, next question. Yeah, thank you. Now let's move on to the next question. Uh, there's a question from Firman from Chemical Engineering UI. Uh, Firman, can you unmute your mic and ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Wahyu. Uh, first of all, is it possible for me to ask a question since I'm a PIC? I hope that's no oh, problem. No problem. No problem. <laughs> okay. Um, I may not be experienced as a uh, Karaihan because I'm really new to this cementing process. Uh, I would like to ask. Uh, maybe a simple question about a thing or two about cementing. So like I have two questions for you right now. So like the first question is, um, you mentioned in your presentation that um, each cement property is conditioned for each geological condition, right? Uh, I mean, like you add additives and stuff to um, change the property of the cement itself to suit yeah. the geological conditions. So my question is like, is it, any scenario or is it possible uh, to use only like knit cement in which only cement and water is mixed like I mean you know a simple cement for uh, the cementing process uh, usually in oil and gas production uh, like you just presented that's my first question and then the second question is um, is it uh, is it possible that uh, for each some uh, uh, I'm sorry I'm gonna move up uh, move back a little, a little little bit that um when uh, i mean like when we dig deeper uh, the condition properties and structure may be changed right so like the cement has to be conditioned properly for its condition for its uh, geological systems um like is it possible for each cementing process that we use different composition of the cement instead of just one oh i think that's uh, just for me it's a simple question maybe thank you very much mr Rohi. okay so like I, I said before, yeah. So the cement actually the cement has a specific water requirement. So the regular class G cement, uh, each pound of class G cement will require half pound of water to be stable. So in this case, if we have one pound of cement and adding a half pound of water, we'll have 15.8 ppg cement. And then this 15.8 will have a specific thickening time, will have specific uh, weight on cement, will have specific fluid load. So if this properties is meet our requirement, for example, if we just drill 
for example like uh, 50 meters the formation is hard enough so we can use 15 8 ppg cement that's fine we can use this regular cement we can use just cement and water to be cement our condition but on the oil and gas industry most of case we have to move from this situation for example we have to pump longer we have to use lighter cement density we have to deal with the porosity with the permeability we have to deal with the gas so the the regular cement may not sufficient with our requirement so we have to see what is the requirement of well so if the well is the requirement is is very low for example if just surface casing nothing special so we can just use the regular cement and then for example if we want to lighten the well we can just add the water but by adding the water we will change the uh ideal situation of the cement by having more cement so probably this not this water some of the volume of water may not react with the cement so there will be some water excess so there will be some free water on it so it will very depend on the uh, our well requirement and then how this regular cement will be uh, depend on this well okay, and then the the second is it possible to use different composition of cement yes so we can so the cement that was prepared usually we only prepare cement for single job for example for intermediate we can only prepare cement for this intermediate so after the intermediate we'll drill production we will use different cement that that uh the thing that we can i can ask for but if the the cement that you are asking as you know on the oil industry other than class g actually there is another class like class a b c d e f but currently the the cementing factory only produce class g that's why we only use class g type of cement answer your question or you have more question uh that uh, that actually answers my uh, question uh really really nicely um but i would like to ask like uh, one more simple question uh, is it is it okay sir okay no problem um just like you say like if we have any excess water that uh, it's called uh free uh free water yes uh what uh, i mean what would the company do if um, there is a, an, an excess water in uh, cement mixing? Like, do we use the uh, like? Do we use use the water again? Like, um, we use the the free water uh, for the next mixing process, or we just uh, waste it? Uh, uh, no, I mean, when we pump the cement. So, for example, mm -hmm. if we pump twelve point five ppg cement into the hole. So if we pump 12.5 PVG cement, just cement and water, it may end with the cement that was settling. So the 15.5, 12.5 PVG side that was we prepare on the surface will change on the down side because on the on the down hole, the 12.5 will be separated, right? Some volume of water going up and then some of volume of cement going down. So meaning the cement volume, cement head that we design previously may change so for example if we if we descend the cement up to 500 feet from the previous casing but since the volume is decreasing so probably top of cement will be not on the on the 1500 feet so if our design is fine we can mitigate this the maximum top of cement will be okay so that will be no problem but if there is there is a risk if we have change of the on the hydrostatic, it may causing the uh, cement, the formation to be fracked, or if the insulation is not as what we require. So if we want insulation up to this depth, but the actual cement in this depth, then it will have uh, the change on the height of cement. So if this change is fine for us, we can use it. But if this, if this change is not with our requir requirement, then we can use it. We cannot use it. So it is possible for like a free water to cause any an un unintentional formation damage, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, sir.
Okay, so maybe for the participants, if you have any question, you can type it on the chat room. Something else? Okay, maybe we can wait for five minutes. Okay, so there's a question from Shaina from Chemical Engineering. She asks, I am curious on the basic formulation of the cement. How to obtain the best formulation for a cement? What kind of test do you do to make sure that the portion of the additives is just right? Or is it very specifically designed for each well? Is it possible to only use several additives, but not the others? Thank you very much for for the very insightful presentation. Okay, Mr. Wahyu, the time is yours. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I just wondering, so this formulation is on the cement itself formulation or on the additive formulation? Because uh, if on the additive formulation, it will very depend on the requirement. Because, for example, if we don't, if we don't need the dispersion, we cannot, we can, we can not use the dispersion. For example, if we not need the lightweight additive, we cannot use the uh, lightweight additive. So, the additive will be very depend on the requirement of the well. So, like I said before, so before uh, designing the well, we before we design the cement sari, we need to know what is the requirement of this uh, cement sari. And then the additive will be follow with this requirement. So we can use just half additive. We can use all the additive, or probably if like Masterman asking, maybe we can only use cement and water only. That that will be very depend on the uh, well challenge. So if the well challenge is 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 slow, not take specific, yeah, we can use we can choose which additive we are gonna use. Let us answer your question. Yeah. Okay, I think she can. I, she can. I unmute her microphone. So, I guess that answered the question. Okay.
for the participants. Are there any of you that have any other question? Yeah, okay. If you have any more question outside of this uh, time, please feel free. You can uh, just ask it to this moderator and the later moderator can uh, forward this question to me and then it will be fairly, uh, I will try my best to answer that question, even at this presentation. Okay, so I have you that as yeah. again. Do you always use centralizer when cementing? Okay, so this will be very dependent. Yeah. So the reason why we use centralizer is if we want to centralize the pipe. Uh, but in some case, if the pipe cannot be centralized, sometimes we cannot use centralizer, for example, if we have requirement to rotate the pipe. And if our centralizer unable to uh, meet this requirement, sometimes we not use centralizer. But if we not use centralizer, we will end up with casing that was not centralized into the well. And this is will be very dangerous because if we don't have the centralization, if we don't have the good centralization, the cement may can only go into the uh, high side and it will not go in the low side. Then we will end up with the well that was not fully cemented. So from cementing perspective, yes, we have to always use centralizer during the cementing, but sometimes it will, it will be on customer choice if they want to use centralizer or they don't want to use centralizer. Okay. So the next question from Nicholas. Hello, Mr. Wahyu. Thank you so much for your presentation. I want to ask about the use of cementing for carbon sequestration. If CCS is to be applied and we are to bury this, CO2 in the ground, is cementing gonna be needed? How is it different than the usual cementing for creating regular drilling casing hole? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So maybe this is the new thing, yeah. So any additive, so why we use cement? Because cement is a material that was not, that was hard to react with any other type of material, but the only thing that can react with cement is uh, CO2. So if we use regular Portland cement and we have high CO2 on the ground, the CO2 will be react with cement. So sooner or later, the cement will be collapsing because the cement is eaten by the CO2. So in this uh, sequence, so actually there is a cement there is a other cement that was not Portland cement. So the cement will not react with the CO2. So actually this is the recommendation. If we have high uh, carbon capture storage, so it's like a CCS project. So the cement that was used should be different. We should not use regular Portland cement for CCS application. And the casing also have to be different, right? If we just use the carbon steel casing, it will eaten by the CO2. So we have to use the chrome casing, we have to use some type of special casing and the cement that was used also have to be specific as well. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question, moderator? Yes. Oh yeah, okay. So Mr. Wahyu, I want to ask uh, just one more thing, Pak. Jadi kalau misalnya carbon uh, capture kita taruh di tanah gitu uh, dalam CO2-nya, is there like any like sort of technical difference kayak kita harus membuat lapisan semen yang misalnya lebih lebar dan berbentuk misalnya menyerupai salt dome gitu, Pak. Jadi si gas ini ketika dia misalnya dia terpanaskan oleh suhu dan suhu di permukaan bumi bawah itu, dia tidak menguap dan naik lagi ke udara gitu, Pak. Apakah okay, ada okay. seperti itu, Pak? Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Saya boleh menjawab dalam bahasa Indonesia juga ya. Jadi gini, ceritanya. Biasanya kalau kita mau melakukan CCS, biasanya kan kita lakukan survei geologikal dulu. 
kita pastikan dulu bahwa formasi yang kita pompa CCS ini sanggup menerima CCS ini. Jadi kalau formasinya itu sudah ketemu, kita akan membuat lubang untuk mengakses formasi itu. Karena pastinya formasi itu nggak boleh merembes ke bumi, kan? Nggak boleh bocor ke tanah. Jadi kita akan buat lubang ke situ, kita akan drill lubang ke situ, tapi setelah kita drill lubang, pasti kita akan pasang casing, karena nggak mungkin kita nggak pasang casing. Kalau kita nggak pasang casing, kita nggak bisa pasang case mystery di atasnya. Kita akan pasang casing dengan ukuran yang lebih kecil, karena ukuran casing dan semen, dan lubangnya ini lebih kecil casing, jadi kan kita harus ngisi ini antara semen dan casing. Nah, semen yang uh, dipasang di sini harus cukup kuat, karena ketika kita pompa CO2, CO2-nya ini pasti akan masuk ke dalam casing, dia akan keluar di perforasi casing, dia akan ketemu dengan semen yang ada di situ. Nah, ketika kita hanya menggunakan reguler semen, semennya itu lama-kelamaan akan rusak ini, karena semen tahan terhadap segala sesuatu kecuali CO2. Nah, makanya semen yang dipakai harus semen khusus, bukan potlan semen biasa. Sudah Baik, Pak. Ya. Oke, terima kasih banyak, Pak Wayu. Ya, sama-sama. Oke, okay. okay. And next question is from Julianto from Geophysics UI. He, he want to ask the question about semen bone lock. Is it is cement bone lock affect the lock data? If CBL affect on lock data, what kind of effect that CBL affect on it? Thank you. So, uh, so CBL cement bone lock. So actually, it is different lock yeah, between CBL and regular lock because the result of the lock data they will see the the uh, gamma ray resistivity to see the the formation. What is the formation? But the CBL. The, if the regular lock was run before we run the casing, the CBL was run after we run the casing. So the CBL will can only see the material behind the casing, which is cement. But if we run CBL, I think it's it's nearly impossible to see the the formation after we set casing. So I think it it is different locking. Yeah, we there is a formation logging, there is a CBL. So CBL and formation logging is two different things. Okay. okay, so for Julianto, that's the answer your question. Uh, mungkin mau nambah lagi, Pak. Uh, yeah, satu, ya, ya. Uh, saya Julianto dari Geofisika UI. Yeah. Mau nanya, Pak, uh, yeah. misalnya nih, Pak, yeah. uh, ada kita pasang semen nih dari perusahaan servis. Yeah. Nah, itu misalnya nih, semennya uh, mungkin bagus, mungkin atau enggak, mungkinnya jelek, atau gimana, yeah. itu dia mempengaruhi data Mem- mem- maksudnya mempengaruhi pembacaan data dari uh, petrofisik gak sih Pak? Enggak, karena data petrofisik itu harusnya di run sebelum pasang casing. Jadi enggak, enggak ngaruh itu. Jadi dia dia selesai selesai bikin lubang, dia run logging, formation logging, baru dia pasang semen. Jadi harusnya sih enggak berpengaruh. Cuman yang berpengaruh ketika kita tidak berhasil melakukan isolasi, ketika kita melakukan semantingnya yang enggak berhasil, hasil CBL-nya jelek, mungkin water zone dan oil zone ini berhubungan, ketemu, jadi ada komunikasi. Ketika kita perforasi di oil zone, yang keluar malah airnya. Jadi itu yang menyebabkan sebenarnya kenapa hasil CBL ini mempengaruhi produksi. Oke, Pak. Mungkin Dan itu aja. Terima kasih ya, Pak. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, now to the next question. It's from Rehan So his question wasn't completed yet. So he asked, do you always use centralizer when doing a cementing job in the deviated wells? Because sometimes the cement bone lock shows that on the kick off point and build section, the cement bone is poor. How do we combat this? Can it be done without the centralizer, but just playing with the cement properties? And how do we do remedial jobs or top job when the casing is not centralized? Okay. So this is the the tough question. Okay. So actually, the cement slurry will act just like the cement slurry. So the slurry as a liquid, they will they will always moving on the on the high side of the well. So if we have a well that was not centralized, so the well was uh, hanging on the on the some part of the well, and then 
it will create some channel. So the, the cement will be only placed on the white side. So there are no cement on the low side of the well. Then nothing we can do. There are no additive that can make cement entering this low side because the cement is cement. It will always go onto the high side. It will never go on the low side. Maybe we can reduce the uh, viscosity of the cement. Maybe we can make the cement thinner, but still there is some space that cannot be uh, that cannot be filled by the cement. So if we not put the centralizer and end up with the bad centralization, the cement result will be always bad. That's, that's, that's the thing. That's the thing that will always happen. And then how we can remediation. So actually the remediation will be much tougher than the primary cement job. If we cannot move the cement during the primary state, how we can move it on the uh, remedial states because on the remedial, maybe we don't have the full circulation. So the thing that can happen probably is spotting the the, the uh, plug on this several depth, but it has to compromise also with the casing uh, integrity as well, because if we do remediation, we perforate the casing, we will end up with the cement with the casing that was not fully, uh, fully, fully good on the first time. So the thing, rather than we we spend a lot of time, a lot of resource to improve this well. So my recommendation is going back again. We have to improve from the first time. That's why the first time is the is the real one. We have to do it right on the first time because the remediation will be. We will spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of uh, resource to uh, remediate this thing. Uh, uh, Raihan, is that does that answer your question? Yeah, actually, uh, terima kasih, Pak. Yeah. Uh, mungkin Pak Wahyu uh, mau nanya juga, kalau misalkan kita casing stringnya itu pakai tieback gitu ya Pak, atau pakai liner di bawahnya gitu, jadi nggak nggak fully digantung di apa wellhead gitu ya, yeah. itu gimana caranya Pak semennya gitu? Apalagi tieback kan sangat kompleks nah, gitu ya. Jadi sebenarnya sih kalau liner itu meskipun casingnya di bawah tetap ada open, tetap ada drill pipe di atasnya, jadi dari atas disambung itu nggak mungkin cuma bawahnya aja. Jadi dari liner disambung pakai drill pipe. Jadi kita pompa dari drill pipe keluar ke liner. Sama dengan tie back. Tie back kan sebenarnya kan cuma nyambung yang liner itu tadi kan. Jadi ketika kita selesai semen job, drill pipe-nya dicabut, liner adapternya dicabut, tinggal linernya jadi bawah. Ketika kita running tie back, disambung lagi itu di atasnya. Kita run tie back, nyambung dari liner atas. Jadi ya pompanya sama aja. Oke Pak, jadi mungkin kalau uh, kita pakai tie back, cementing jobnya jadi dua kali ya. Jadi si productionnya sama si betul uh, dua kali liner job tie baru tie back job. Oke sih, makasih banyak Pak. Ya. Oke. For the participants, maybe other any other questions? Oke, okay, uh, guys, do you have maybe more questions? Atau saya boleh nanya lagi ya, Pak Wahyu? Boleh. <laughs> boleh, Pak. Ya, jadi, saya ingin bertanya, Pak. Um, jadi, geothermal itu kan perkembangan di Indonesia sepertinya di gadang-gadang ini ya, Pak. Um, kita ada um, besar potensinya di Indonesia Timur dan lain-lain. Namun dari, jadi waktu itu saya dan ada rekan saya juga di sini, kita sempat magang. Namun bukan di Halliburton sih Pak, kami di Slumberjay, tapi yeah. kurang lebih kita tahu juga kayaknya gimana. Dan katanya geothermal itu membutuhkan kondisi yang lebih, ini ya Pak, kayak mungkin yang Raihan bilang HPHT. 
Dan kalau geothermal itu biasanya precaution apa sih Pak yang diambil oleh cementing companies? Dan juga saya penasaran tuh Pak kalau geothermal di 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 tempat yang remote gitu. Gimana sih cara bawa equipment kayak truk segede tadi untuk cementing? Mungkin Bapak boleh cerita seperti apa di lapangan gitu Pak. Itu saja dari saya Pak pertanyaannya. Terima kasih Pak. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, jadi kan kalau mungkin kita balik lagi ke basic geothermal ya. Mungkin kan ada beberapa kuliah tamu mengenai geothermal. Apa itu geothermal? Mungkin saya juga uh, tidak terlalu paham mengenai hal itu, tapi sedikit banyak saya tak ya, saya ya saya tahu aja kan. Kan sebenarnya kan geothermal itu kan dia mengambil hasil dari uap yang ada di dalam bumi. Kalau memang uapnya itu dry, nggak ada uapnya, cuma panasnya aja kita harus pompa air dulu biar jadi uap. itu membutuhkan waktu lama. Atau kalau memang memang sudah keluar uapnya, di situ ada water water flow di situ, ada heat di situ, dia akan keluar steam. Sebenarnya dari geothermal ini kan yang dimanfaatkan kan steam. Nah, mungkin kalau kita belajar di apa ya yang steam table itu mata kuliah apa ya itu. Nah, steam table itu kan biasanya kan steam itu kan ada pressure, ada temperatur. Semakin tinggi pressure, semakin tinggi temperaturnya kan. Kalau temperatur di bumi mungkin kalau inti bumi itu kan temperaturnya sampai 7000 degree Celcius. Mungkin dia merembet-rembet ke atas ada yang sampai 400 degree Celcius, 300 degree Celcius, 200 degree Celcius, macam-macam lah ya. Seperti yang tadi Raihan tanyakan kalau uh, production-nya itu masih temperaturnya itu masih normal cuma 200 mungkin cuma 200 degree Celcius, 250 degree Celcius. Production rate-nya juga enggak besar. Sebenarnya reguler semen pun juga cukup ini. Akan tetapi di beberapa kondisi ketika production rate-nya itu besar, temperaturnya itu sangat tinggi, maka eh, kondisi-kondisi itu jadi nggak 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 stabil. Jadi misalnya kalau temperaturnya itu sangat tinggi, casing elongation-nya itu jadi sangat tinggi, force of elongation itu jadi lebih tinggi. Jadi ada kemungkinan semen ini akan lepas dari casing. itu yang yang mungkin harus kita mitigasi di awal. Jadi uh, cementing company saat ini dia mulai menyadari bahwa cementing properties itu bukan hanya kompresif strength. Karena kompresif strength dia punya limit terhadap strength. Akan tetapi ketika kita berbicara dengan elongation of strength, kadang force of elongation itu jauh lebih besar daripada kompresif strength. Ketika force of elongation itu jauh di atas kompresif strength, apa yang terjadi? yang terjadi casing lepas dari semen. Apa yang terjadi ketika casing lepas dari semen? Semen nggak lagi memberikan ikatan di casing. Artinya apa? Artinya akan terjadi kebocoran itu antara semen dan casing. Artinya apa? Antara artinya mungkin ketika well sudah produksi, steam yang asalnya dari bawah dia akan instead of masuk di dalam casing, dia lebih mudah lewat di samping. Akhirnya kita nggak bisa memproduksi well itu. Jadi Uh, pada akhirnya well yang awalnya kita desain kita ingin produksi hasilnya bagus dengan kondisi yang yang berbeda dengan kondisi yang awal akhirnya well tidak bisa kita kita produksi makanya uh, semen di geothermal semen yang di geothermal untuk beberapa case mungkin semen biasa saja akan bisa kan tetapi untuk case-case khusus ketika temperaturnya itu sangat tinggi produksinya besar Semen itu harus kita desain berbeda. Kita harus bikin semen nggak hanya high compressive strength, tapi juga harus low modulus yang low poison ratio seperti itu. Oke Pak, uh, mungkin kalau yang tentang truk-truk itu Pak, kalau oh, iya, iya. yang terpencil itu. <laughs> Oke, okay. jadi untuk geothermal industry, karena kan kalau Mungkin selama bersih punya IPM, Haliburton punya IPM. Nah, di IPM itu kan, jadi kalau kita membuat sumur, sembama ngebor satu sumur, sebenarnya biaya terbesar untuk geothermal itu bukan ngebor sumurnya, tapi membuat akses ke dalam sumur itu. Karena kan alat-alatnya tadi kan bisa dilihat besar-besar banget kan. Kayak truknya itu 40 ton, kemudian silonya itu besar. Jadi ya memang kita harus membuat akses jalan ke sana. Nggak bisa, diangkat pakai chopper itu nggak bisa. dia harus dibuatkan jalan ke sana. Jadi memang inilah yang mungkin jadi PR pemerintah ya. Mungkin uh, geothermal itu kan adanya di gunung-gunung. Akses gunung-gunung itu tidak mudah. Jadi investasi untuk membuat geothermal itu bukan hanya ngebor sumurnya, tapi juga bikin jalan ke sana juga. Seperti itu. 
Oke, okay, baik, Pak. Uh, terima kasih ya, Pak. Ya. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wahyu, for answering the questions from our participants. Now, I guess uh, that's enough for the Q&A session. Maybe if other participants want to ask, maybe they can they ask you through email or... Sure, sure. Sorry. Uh, you can ask through you and then you can forward it to me as well. Maybe you can contact... Uh, the PIC of this event, yes, and Allah you will answer it outside. Inshallah. <laughs> so, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, we have come to the end of our virtual lab visit. On behalf of SPEYIC, I would like to once again thank our speaker, Mr. Wahyu, who has made the time to share his amazing insights for us. You truly enhance our knowledge about cementing process and technology at Halliburton Cementing Laboratory. We would also like to thank our audience for your participation during the session. Hopefully, the information that has been shared throughout this virtual lab visit will be useful for all of us. So, Mr. Wahyu, would you like to add a few words to our audiences? <laughs> okay, uh, maybe just... Uh... Uh, small talk yes. Okay, okay. So oil industry is up and down. So probably this is time when oil industry is in the in the low side. So probably if we see uh back uh, before oil industry is, is not as good as what happened before. But I believe other than oil industry, actually this this uh industry is not only about oil and gas. There's another thing like. Maybe we talk about is about geothermal. So probably, if there is a future, oil industry is not really that good. There is still uh, geothermal. So if SPE Society of Petroleum Engineers, so probably it can be changed by Society of apa ya? <laughs> of drilling engineer because that's not only about the petroleum. There is a geothermal. There was another thing, or maybe there is a CCS. There is a thing. So. Actually, this drilling industry is not only about petroleum. It's also about geothermal. It's also about CCS. So probably there is a new thing. Maybe right now we know that Indonesia is producing 40% of nickel around the world. So probably, I don't know, maybe sometimes we will drill for nickel. So this industry has to move, not only for petroleum. Okay, thank you, sir. So before we end the session, I would like to ask all of the participants to fill out the QC. Maybe. Okay, you can fill the QC through the link on the chat room. Okay, so the QC will be shown on the screen and you can fill it for the next two minutes. Uh, filling out the QC is one of the requirements to receive a certificate for joining our event. Okay, so while we wait for those who are still filling out the QC, I would like to introduce Mr. David Nicodemus, Project Officer of PGD UE 2021. For Mr. David, the time is yours. Uh, okay, thank you, moderator, for uh, this time. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David, and I'm here to introduce you one of uh, our event, as you all know, maybe uh, our annual event, uh, one of Indonesia's most prestigious uh, energy and process engineering event, which is uh, PGD UI or Process Engineering and Energy Days Industry of Indonesia. So uh, yeah, maybe you have uh, already uh, uh, seen our publications in social media, in LinkedIn or in our websites. Uh, we have already opened the registration for our three competitions. 
uh, currently we have five competitions, which is uh, Petronation, uh, Smart uh, Competition, uh, SCMUN, uh, MUN Competition, uh, CPDC, uh, pro uh, Product Design Competition, ICAS, uh, Case Study Competition, and Chemicar. Uh, so in this uh, five competitions, we have already opened for ICAS, uh, CPDC, and also uh, Chemicar. So for more details, you can uh, always uh, visit our uh, social medias at uh, our Instagram and Twitter in, at PGDUI and also the website at uh, PGDUI.com. Uh, next. Uh, yeah, so uh, for our competition, uh, actually uh, in our previous events, uh, we managed to get more than 1400 applicants. And yeah, and we have more than uh, 100 million prize to be won uh, total, in total. So uh, yeah, for more updates, you can all, always uh, visit our social media and this is the uh, team. Next. Sorry, next, yeah. So this is our team catalyzing the advancement of uh, global sustainability. Uh, sorry, not this one. <laughs> yeah, okay. So. Um, our team for PGD is actually uh, quite related, uh, very related about uh, sustainable industrial development. So, uh, yeah, maybe uh, uh, do, uh, maybe some of you uh, will wa wondering why uh, we uh, promote this kind of event in SPE. Yeah, I think uh, sustainability is the uh, our major issue right now uh, in petroleum engineering and chemical engineering also. So, yeah. I think there will be so much uh, future leaders that will be uh, passionate uh, to dig in about this sustainability issue and also challenge their uh, innovations in our competitions. Next. Oh uh, yeah, I, I mentioned this before. Uh, we managed to get 1400 and more participants in our past five competitions and next. Yeah, so uh, this is more detailed uh, detailed information about our competition and also the timeline. Uh, for CPDC, ICAS, and uh, SEMUN, uh, mainly uh, we have the uh, team. So uh, actually it's very related to uh, the current issue right now, which is a uh, pandemic issue, COVID-19. Uh, for CPDC, we uh, chosen the topic mitigate, mitigating global crisis in a sustainable way. So uh, the product design of uh, uh, products that will mitigate uh, this current condition of global crisis. And also for ICAS, uh, looking for uh, ideas to maintain the sustainability of uh, sugar production in Indonesia. And also for SME in achieving sustainable development goals, SDG. So yeah, if you would like uh, to ask more questions, um, uh, feel free to ask me and also to contact our marketing team listed uh, below there. Okay, also to visit our uh, website for the detailed information. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all for me. 